So what gets in the way the most when you start TWIM? Hindrances, that's one thing. Hindrance, um, past hindrance uh, knowledge, we could say that. That's a big, it's a block that it can be a big block if the past information about hindrances that you had was we got to get rid of this thing. <laughs> it sounds like a good idea. <laughs> but the problem here is why isn't that a good idea? Well, it's because of Atta. You are going to embrace Atta and personally try to make a hindrance stop without researching first how the hindrance actually operates. So that's a big block, isn't it? Because once you find out, you know, we'll just say that's one of the blocks, okay. Another thing is um, what gets in the way from pe for past meditators is how we sit can be a block. There was a lot of stress on sitting erect. And I mean erect, stiff in the spine, absolutely straight like this, the whole entire thing. Not necessarily a good thing. Doesn't help the energy to go up the back if and down the front if uh, you are too tight in the spine. Blocks that energy flow. Um, another one was it's okay to move. Okay to move and change position. That's another one that is a forbidden, meaning it's just not okay to move at all. All right, that was one of them. Um, a good one I ran into that I didn't expect once, it's okay to keep my eyes open. To keep my eyes open. Now, I think this, I'm not sure how it happened, how it started in the tradition this came from, I don't know. But um, obviously when people close their eyes, too many people were falling asleep, which is what I was told by them. I'm not making this up. Um, and so the best thing to do is keep your eyes open. So if you don't explain there's actually something to see inside, well, you're just going to follow instructions and watch that. And when that ants, when you people, I, wa I walked in accidentally and there was a class going on with 30 people with their seats facing the walls and they were just staring at the wall. The only problem is the ants <laughs> that come across, you know, and then your eyes are open. And this was a misunderstanding about secluding yourself from sense pleasures and then examining for yourself how do sense pleasures happen. And if you were able to watch what's in front of you, you're definitely, your, your eyes going to do it automatically grab a hold of the ant and follow him off the screen and then come back, <laughs> you see? So these people weren't going anywhere, but except they were being calm, sitting still, reaching a form of temporary tranquility without any personality change, without changing anything in behavior patterns or relationships or anything, but they were relaxing, you know? And if that's what they want, in Washington, D.C., that was something that was very, very valuable with any kind of meditation, stopping the movement from being during the daytime where we're struggling by living in the belly of the beast. That's what we called Washington, DC, <laughs> the belly of the beast. And it was a vibrating, high energy, functioning madness that went on all day, no matter what building you were in, no matter what was going on, when you got on the street, you felt it all around you, the tenseness the fear, the anxiety, the greed, everything all wrapped up, wrapping around you. So sitting anywhere where there wasn't any noise, there could not be any noise at all, with the lights dimmed, 
they like to even come and stay late and turn them out and sit in the dark, was totally and functionally something for that pause in their life and to relax and there's nothing wrong with it. If that's where it's going and that's what you want, okay. But as far as progress, the way we think of it towards the actual objective in Buddhism, we're not going anywhere, you see? And um, so you, you don't want to move at all in your position, and that was happening. How to sit was sometimes, okay, another issue was pain. Somewhere, sometime, we lost the information about meditation pain and physical pain. We lost it. And when we lost that information, which you can test for yourself to prove, I'm not telling you something that's bogus, okay? I'm telling you something that's absolutely real that you can learn to test for yourself. The message became, this is serious work. It is very difficult. And when there is pain, just bear and grit it and stay through it no matter what. No knowledge of pain. Okay. Um, so these are the things that get in way in the way. And you can probably think of some others. And the biggest one is hindrance knowledge of not having information about the root cause of hindrances. But just above that one is how do they operate? How do they live? How do they originate? How do they exist and disappear? What feeds them? And once you learn that, you have to take, make, it's like making a vow to yourself when you sit down, no matter what arises, I will not move. I shall not move. I shall simply stay still. If there's nothing in my mind, one person said, what bothered them more than anything for a number of years, <laughs> okay, was that when they got to a place where there was absolutely nothing, it drove them crazy. <laughs> and this was a high energy, I'm in charge person, you know, organizer structurally at work, managing everybody. And then when they went home to sit, the very idea there could be a place that existed with nothing I have to make work. It was the biggest barrier they faced. So finally they looked at it and saw clearly they were doing that. Didn't want to admit it before. Now I will tell you a story about that just so if you ever teach somebody you can that's like that, you can assure them of this. And this comes from Ajahn Chah. He had someone once come uh, who was getting instruction or he was teaching a retreat where this woman existed. She was from New York City. And um, she was very like this, very busy all the time. And he could see that no matter what happened, she was not going to let go of this. He finally decided first as a middle platform before I tell you, just don't let anything come if you if you have to have a middle platform here it is you have a blue trash can here you have a pink trash can here you have a silver one up here is what he said the blue trash can uh, this one over here the blue trash can that is from everything that happened in the past even today and if anything comes up in your mind and you can say, I'm, I'm going to tell you, you can only label these things three ways. It goes in the blue trash can, the pink one, or the silver one. That's it. Then leave it alone and start to do what I tell you for the meditation, he said. So in the blue trash can, anything from the past. In the pink trash can, anything about the future. And the silver one is where some people will break out of their sitting and get a book real quick because they thought of the solution for something. And he assured her, if you just put that in that silver trash can right here, it's going to come back to you after you're finished meditating. And those things did come back. She said that later. Those things did come back. He knew what he was talking about. 
These are the three different types of things that will come up. And after a little while, this was like a month retreat. And after a week or so, she said, I don't think I need the trash can. He said, good, then tell me you're not going to move for anything and just let it be. And she did, and she made progress. Now, what is it from before meditation that helps a person the, the most, okay? That was the other question. And, you know, I watched what we were doing for a number of years and I said, there's gotta be a better way to talk about this. Now I will tell you the shock of my of life in the last year, I just not recently, but about two weeks ago, I took out a whole bunch of charts from three years and looked at them, okay? For what's been going on in India. The people who got to breaking through the easiest were those people who had been in Goenka for a long time. How about that? How about that? So should we poo poo Goenka? No, because then I had to say, okay, why did this happen? What's happening? Should poo poo anything? That's what I came to the conclusion. Doesn't matter what kind of meditation that you ever worked on in your life. Did you get something valuable from it? It didn't cure your life, didn't change your relationships, didn't solve things, maybe. But what did you get from it that would transfer into another practice pretty easily? They don't move period. <laughs> they don't move. All right. So they don't move. They know that don't, don't move. They, some of times, some of them want to shift uh, during, but they'll stop really quickly. If you tell them this is the instruction. Okay. They follow instructions. If you hang it on them really seriously, please follow the instructions precisely. They will they follow the instructions, okay? And they take about three, four days usually, sometimes five, but usually four days, three or four days to let go of breath, of the breath, because they honestly are ready to to consider how I explain it to them when I talk to them about an object in meditation. There's nothing wrong with the breath. If you were actually following to the letter, the instructions in the Majjhima Nikaya, but there's nothing on there that says you have to stick on the breath and don't move away from it. It's not in there. It's not there. So I said, we'll do anything that the instructions tell you to do. Went back to the instructions and looked. They had to admit it didn't say you were supposed to analyze anything or concentrate on something, just that you were supposed to understand what's happening while you're breathing. When they looked at it that way, all those internal instructions in the dyads became different they became slightly different. And the other thing is I told them the true story of two people who came to a retreat once, two ladies the same age. They were in about their, maybe about their 40s. And one in the morning showed up and one in the afternoon after I asked Bonte a particular question. I asked him, have you ever experienced a breathing meditator who believes that if they did anything else, they would not be able to breathe. Has that ever happened? And if it did happen, I said, what did you do? And he said, I have, and maybe you will. And then that morning, a woman came in and said, I cannot do meta. And I listened from a distance. He was interviewing her. And she, he said, why? And she said, because I am totally convinced if I practice meta, I won't be able to breathe. 
and I, you know, I, I was behind her. I was, it seems so funny to me, but it wasn't funny. She was very serious. If I try to do anything else, I won't be able to breathe. So he said a few things. And then I said, can, can I ask a question? And he said, sure. And I asked her, I said, could you please tell me when you were seven years old and you were outside running around with other girls playing tag, did you breathe? Well, she said, of course I did. I was running around outside. Did you make yourself breathe? No, I was playing tag. <laughs> it's simple, yeah. And then she started going, oh, oh. And she went away and she corrected it. Took her about two days to correct it, but she corrected it. And then she started to make progress. But by saying to someone an object is important enough in a meditation to watch it like this, absolutely pointed at it. Do you see what her brain did? It believed that was true to the extent you cannot live unless you are, every time you stop doing anything, aware of your breathing, but not aware of it in control of your breathing. Control. Is it in the instructions? Go back and look. So we were doing something that was in, in maybe some religions considered a great sin. We were questioning. <laughs> and the Americans are like that. We question everything. <laughs> we question, question, question. That's what makes life so fun. Why do I keep doing this? Because I can question everything, you see. And so that was one of the things that was a shock to me that someone had take, actually done that. The woman who came in the afternoon, it was like an identical replay of the movie. They weren't related. They were on other sides of the room. There were about 35 people, I think, at that retreat. They're on opposite sides of the room, not involved with each other. She came in the afternoon and said exactly the same thing to us. And we replayed the, the thing about playing tag, and it worked on both of them. See? The Goenka student is devoted to keep going with something, to really keep going with it, determined to go to all of the insights, you see, determined to have that experience happen. You can usually explain to the Goenka student when you exam, I've read the book a number of times, the instruction book for Goenka, it's a good one. And I've gone through other books by him and listened to a lot of his talks. I don't, I think that if he had ever been alive and we could have had him, I'm not sure if he would have been open-minded about it, but I like to think he was because he was a very great man and he, he did some wonderful Dhamma talks, okay? And I felt like if he only knew, if he had known, what would he have done? Would he have sat down and talked? Would he have tested anything someone else said? I think maybe he would have. That's my suspicion. This is also the way I feel about, um, about the past um, uh, Ayakema. I feel like she would have if she'd been allowed to be exposed more to the text, but she was raised strictly on a con by a group of monks, exposed to a group of monks that were commentarially bound. And because of that, they didn't go into the texts, you see, except for brief descriptions of Jonas and things like that. What is it from the meditation that helps you the most are what we're talking about. And so how you sat, how long you can sit, those things, if you've developed time for sitting, you're in good shape and you probably can transfer that over. We ask you to do strange things. What blocks you the most from other meditations is do not smile. <laughs> okay, do not smile. Okay, do not smile. And, um, you know, do not, you know, we, that's what blocks you from bringing that over and not ever smiling before you'll start smiling, 
But of course, if you've been to my retreats again, you know about something else. You know about um, this little guy here. This is actually my professional um, tickle, 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 smile. You're in retreat, I will come and get you. Smile. Why do I want you to smile so much? I want you to smile. And I tell you ahead of time, so you don't think there's a big bug on you. I tell you, this is going to happen to you. If you don't smile, I will be going around the room and I will tickle you. And so you'll smile because there's a muscle that is right here and it hooks up to right here at the corner of the inner corner of the eye, like right there, which goes up into the brain up here and triggers a separation of the two hemispheres slightly when they calm down. It has a tremendous effect to have it calm down and separate a tiny bit. And the endorphins flow and uplifted joy happens. And then you want to smile. <laughs> you want to smile. That's how this works. And so the more open you are and the more that you are not there. I think a great deal what I hear from other types of meditation is we have to work hard. Well, there's an old adage my father taught me, work smart, not hard. We see a lot in, in TWIM. We have a vision inside, an open visual inside, the same as we see things outside. We see this vision uh, inside like this. And we have a peripheral point, meaning peripheral is like how far can you see the fingers when you go like this out like that how long when you're going back towards yourself like this can you see those fingers how wide is your peripheral vision i talked to you about that vision is inside too like that and so you can see why if you're seeing an inside screen like this you can see where they used to be like that they have to change one of the reasons they never did that is because they don't believe there's anything there. When you're looking at your meditation, you come back and you say, with twim, anything goes. We are not who we thought we were. In Buddhism, I found a new word today, and I want to use it as synergy. And the synergy is taking all the ingredients and bringing it together to make a new kind of catalyst. Buddhism was a remarkable, remarkable discovery for anybody from the person who was walking around all day with the cattle, who was actually a perfect candidate for doing the meditation during the day, to the highest CEO or president of a country or king or whatever you want to talk about being a candidate as well, to the richest, to the poorest, to the biggest, to the smallest. Anybody can be still, close your eyes, and start to see how things work and not interrupt anything. Don't compare it to anything else. Can you study the body without considering feeling or mind or dhammas? What's arising up? Can you? What for? Just the anatomy of the body in science class, I guess, but... You can't really learn anything as far as the meditation is concerned, unless it's all involved. Can you say, can you actually spend months on just feeling and say, feeling is my object, nothing else, not body, not mind, not dhammas? No, of course not. You can't. Can you study feeling without your body, without your mind involved or without dhammas? No, no. Can you study mind without body feeling and dhammas? going on, phenomena arising and passing away. No, no. Can you study just the phenomena without body, feeling, or mind? No. So in a way, that one's almost like four circles and another molecule. You can meet and greet the parts of faith, energy, mindfulness, um, collectedness, and wisdom. You can, you can meet them individually. Meet and greet the neighbors if you want, but you can't live with them for 20 years without getting to know how they function and how everything operates, can you?